Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Robin Dwyer. Welcome to the programme. Our top stories. Crisis diplomacy. The US Secretary of State begins his latest tour of the Middle East, hoping to prevent the conflict spreading. Israeli attacks continue across the Gaza Strip. Palestinian officials say that more refugee camps have been hit. Culture bringing two countries closer together. Events are underway, marking 60 years of ties between China and France. And former Paralympic champion Oscar Pistorius is released from prison on parole 11 years after murdering his girlfriend. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is expected to arrive in Tel Aviv in the coming hours. His week-long tour of the Middle East will be his fourth since the latest conflict began in October. The United States is trying to defuse tensions in the region, where fears are growing that the conflict in Gaza could spiral into broader unrest. More than 160 Palestinians were killed in Israeli attacks overnight, including strikes on refugee camps and areas that had previously been designated as safe zones by the Israeli military. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Trent Murray, who's in Tel Aviv. Uh, so, Trent, what are we expecting from Anthony Blinken's visit today? Well, Robin, America's top diplomats flying in at a time where it really feels tensions are escalating rather than subsiding. We know from the State Department that this visit is going to focus on a number of areas, uh, according to a readout. First and foremost is the situation on the ground in Gaza. We know the Americans have been pushing Israel for answers on when they're going to move away from the high-intensity warfare that we've been seeing to more targeted operations. The delivery of aid also high on the agenda as the UN continues to warn that food, medicine and water remains very much in short supply in the besieged strip. We also understand there will be discussions around the hostages. There's around 120 of them or so, a bit more than that actually still being held by Hamas, uh, including American citizens. Secretary Blinken's team is saying they want to have discussions around trying to secure their safe release. And then there are some of the more regional concerns that we are tracking. Of course, we know tensions remain very high right now up on the north of the Israel border with Lebanon. The Israeli army remains at its highest state of readiness, effectively waiting and watching to see whether Hezbollah uh, will respond militarily to that strike in Beirut. I think it's important to note Blinken is not the only big diplomat uh, in this region right now. The EU's top uh, foreign affairs official, Joseph Borrell, he is also flying in to spend 48 hours in Lebanon with a real focus on trying to defuse tensions between Hezbollah and Israel. And we've heard from the Israeli government, uh, which has outlined its plans for the future governance of Gaza. What has it said? Yeah, that's right. It's a one-page document which has been released by Yoav Gallant, the country's defence minister, and it looks at what the Israelis say is the day after the war, effectively what will happen to Gaza when this conflict comes to an end. There are kept several key takeaways. The first is that the Israelis maintain that Gaza does remain a Palestinian territory, and so in their view it does need to be governed in its civilian affairs by the Palestinian political system, uh, but they have ruled out entirely Hamas making any sort of return to governance of that region. They also say, though, that they want to maintain security. That is Israel overseeing the security situation within Gaza. They say they're doing that to make sure no militants can attack the people of Israel again. They say they also want to maintain checks and inspections on all goods going in and out. Uh, and crucially, they name Egypt as a key partner that needs to do more. They say they are having discussions around what Cairo can do to sort of help Gaza get back on its feet after this war comes to an end. And on that final question of what happens when the war comes to an end, on the rebuilding and rehabilitation of people that have been living through this war, they say the US, European countries and others within this region should lead a multi-nation task force to oversee the rebuilding of Gaza. Trent, thank you very much. Our correspondent Trent Murray in Tel Aviv. Well, that's the view from Israel. Let's uh, head to Gaza now and talk to our correspondent in central Gaza, Noor Harazin. Uh, Noor, tell us about uh, the latest attacks that have taken place across the Gaza Strip.
Well, the Israeli troops have withdrawn from large areas from northern Gaza, so we can say that it is uh, calm now in northern Gaza. However, the Israeli army intensified its attacks on middle Gaza and southern Gaza. Since the early hours of this morning, and most of the Israeli strike hit uh, places and homes in uh, Khan Yunis city, Rafah city, here in middle Gaza and Deir el Balah, and the refugee camps surrounding Deir el Balah, like the Al Maghazi refugee camp. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry and in a joint statement with the uh, Palestinian media office, they said that 162 Palestinians were killed in Gaza over the past 24 hours. And this brings up the death toll here in Gaza up to. 22,600 Palestinians, 70% of them are women and uh, children. Uh, talking about the Al Maghazi refugee camp, uh, actually, uh, this area was marked as a safe area. No evacuation order was released. So, uh, people who are residing inside the Al Maghazi refugee camp, they just woke up on the sounds of heavy Israeli uh, shelling and heavy, heavy Israeli uh, airstrikes shortly after the Israeli tanks started. Uh, its land and cogent in the Al Maghazi refugee camp, forcing hundreds of families to evacuate. However, uh, until now and while we were speaking, there is people from inside the camp that, that they are stuck inside the camp and they are calling upon the Red Cross, the international community, the UN, to uh, somehow find a way to evacuate them. And Noor, the uh, humanitarian situation in Gaza uh, is still very difficult, uh, with aid groups appealing for more supplies. Well, of course, the thing here is that uh, Egypt allows a very little number of humanitarian aid trucks to enter the Gaza Strip every day. Even after the opening of uh, Karim Abu Salem border between Gaza and uh, Israel, where uh, some aid trucks are actually now going through this uh, border, the Karim Abu Salem. However, uh, Palestinians working at the border, they are saying that the same amount of humanitarian aid trucks are entering Gaza now, like the previous. Uh, uh, weeks. However, they split the number actually between the two borders. So that's why the uh, Palestinians here on the ground, they are not feeling any change. At the same time, the aid groups here, the UN and also other organizations, they are very hard uh, struggling. They are struggling actually because of the lack of uh, fuel, because there is no safety for their teams to go around and distribute the aid in <clears throat> northern Gaza and also in middle Gaza. Adding the fact that uh, Northern Gaza is now isolated from the rest of Gaza Strip. So for days now, zero aid trucks actually entered Northern Gaza, where we're talking about more than a half of a million people who are still uh, there inside Northern Gaza, and they did not evacuate their homes. No, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Noor Harazin, in central Gaza. Officials in Seoul say the DPRK has fired more than 200 artillery rounds towards a disputed maritime border. South Korea's military responded by holding its own maritime shooting exercise. Beijing has urged both sides to show restraint and resume dialogue. Our correspondent Jack Barton reports. DPRK leader Kim Jong-un had said in recent days that the peninsula is spiralling towards war, blaming the United States and South Korea and saying his forces must prepare to suppress the South in the event of a crisis. On Friday morning, the DPRK fired about 200 artillery rounds into a buffer zone that had until recently been part of a 2018 agreement aimed at reducing tensions along the demilitarized zone. That agreement was partially suspended by Seoul and unilaterally abandoned by Pyongyang after the launch of the DPRK's first military surveillance satellite in November. The artillery rounds landed within the DPRK's waters. But residents on three South Korean islands were told to evacuate to bomb shelters, where they spent three and a half hours as South Korea conducted its own counter drill, firing about 400 artillery rounds into the buffer zone for the first time since the now abandoned 2018 agreement went into effect. Yonpyong Island was struck by DPRK artillery in 2010, leaving four people dead and more than 20 injured. The area was also the site of two deadly naval battles in 1999 and 2002.
Recently, both the DPRK and South Korea have warned that the risk of clashes is expected to be heightened throughout 2024. Jack Barton, CGTN, Seoul. Rescue teams in Japan are still hoping to find survivors of an earthquake which struck on New Year's Day. They're also trying to deliver aid to tens of thousands of people who fled their homes. Our correspondent Chris Gilbert reports from Tokyo. Well, rain, snow and landslides are making a difficult job even harder for search and rescue team. Japan is now well and truly past the 72-hour window believed by experts to be absolutely crucial to find and rescue survivors. However, miraculous rescues are still happening. Late on Thursday, an 80-year-old woman uh, was found and rescued alive and uh, rescued from the rubble of her collapsed house where she had just spent three days. So there is hope still to find survivors. However, the situation remains dire for survivors and for evacuees. Aid is very badly needed and very hard to come by, particularly water, fuel, uh, food and other essential supplies. The roads are so badly damaged. In fact, uh, locals are asking anyone who comes to the region to have a clear plan because there are reports that people are getting stuck on the damaged roads and having to be rescued by the self-defense force and other emergency responders uh, which otherwise could be uh, you know conducting the search for survivors in the rubble the town of suzu which lost 90 percent of its 5,000 uh, houses it is bad bad need of uh, hands to transport aid and uh, of aid itself the town of wajima people are reportedly melting snow 30,000 uh, evacuees uh, remain in evacuation centers and the government is warning that they may stay in a prolonged state of evacuation. The government is uh, expanding the number of uh, rescue uh, personnel from about a thousand to four and a half thousand but there is a concern that time is running out. The focus is starting to shift to the rebuild and recovery stage uh, but at the moment uh, there is a last uh, ditch frantic search for survivors and to distribute aid through the region. Chris Gilbert for CGTN in Tokyo. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Celebrations as China and France mark 60 years of ties. We're in Paris next. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTS. I think it should be more global cooperation. I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The green transition has to happen. So it's, it's, it's a necessity. Well, China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. This week on Razor, travelling back in time using the DNA of our ancient ancestors. When the pendant arrived, it was still covered in sediment as it was found. We first want to wash off the sediment and also analyse the sediment because we want to compare then the DNA that we find in the sediment to the DNA we find in the pendant. And that allows us to make some comparisons that the DNA that we find is really from the maker or the wearer of the pendant. Welcome back. A reminder of our headlines. Crisis diplomacy. The U.S. Secretary of State begins his latest tour of the Middle East, hoping to prevent the conflict spreading. And Israeli attacks continue across the Gaza Strip. Palestinian officials say that more refugee camps have been hit. 
China's foreign minister says it's vital that China and the United States work together. Wang Yi delivered a speech at an event marking 45 years since the two countries established diplomatic ties. He said cooperation is no longer a dispensable choice. Well, let's talk to our correspondent Dong Shui in Beijing. Uh, so uh, this event celebrating the ties between China and the United States. What did Wang Yi have to say about that relationship? Sure, well, just a couple of hours ago, you know, the reception was held here uh, in the state guest house in Beijing to celebrate the 45th anniversary since ties were established between China and the United States, where Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi reiterated that cooperation is the right path for the two countries moving forward. He said both countries should follow the consensus reached by the two heads of state in San Francisco last November and better manage differences while broadening cooperation. And he also mentioned that starting from the first day of January, Wang Yi said that Beijing is working on the new visa process for U.S. citizens while opening the doors to 50,000 American students to come to China in the next five years. And also he mentioned that cute pandas are getting ready to return to California as well. Wang then said that Beijing has no intention of seeking hegemony and is willing to build a stable, healthy and sustainable relationship with the United States. He said that this would serve the interests of both nations. And also, you know, the numbers speak for themselves while when judging the importance of the China-U.S. relationships. You know, bilateral trade has now reached 760 billion U.S. dollars with 260 billion worth of investments. And Wang also reiterated that peace must at the foundation, must be at the foundation of the relationship and would benefit all humankind. He said that both bear uh, important responsibilities for upholding world peace and global security. And over the past few decades, whether, you know, from fighting terrorism or Ebola, he said the world has seen the power of China-U.S. cooperation. Robin? And we know there have been tensions between the two countries in recent years. Uh, are there signs that this rela these relations are improving? Well, I would say the uh, Xi Biden summit in San Francisco last November was definitely a positive sign, you know, but as Wang Yi has put it, it's more important for both sides to actually implement all these agreements reached by the two heads of the states. You know, it's still too early to tell whether this will happen, but I'd say, you know, China has is never going to impose its version of truth onto the U.S. as China will never impose its philosophy, its political system, or its ideology on any other the country in the world, just like President Xi Jinping insisted that the world is big enough for both to grow and develop in their own way while still complementing and supporting each other. So uh, I remember in San Francisco, the two leaders welcomed the, welcomed the resumption of bilateral cooperation to combat the global drug trafficking trade, including synthetic drugs like Sentinel. They also welcomed the uh, return of high-level military to military communication and affirmed the need to address risk involving artificial intelligence through bilateral discussions. So I think the next step is to see how these meetings in San Francisco develops in a practical, concrete manner moving forward. Robin. Shui, thank you very much. My correspondent Dong Shui in Beijing. Meanwhile, events are underway to mark 60 years of diplomatic ties between China and France. The two countries have declared 2024 a year of culture and tourism. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, uh, Ross Cullen, who is in Paris. Uh, so, Ross, how's this anniversary being marked in France? Well, Robin, the, uh, the French Foreign Minister, Catherine Colonna, released a note earlier uh, today officially marking the start of the 2024 year of Franco-Chinese tourism. She looked back on her discussions and conversations with Wang Yi, her Chinese counterpart, during 2023 and looked forward to 2024 uh, being the official year of French-Chinese tourism. And to that end, the French tourism minister herself, Olivier Gregoire, has been on a two-day visit to uh, China. There's going to be lots of cultural exchanges, person-to-person -person exchanges, artistic and creative events, all, of course, anchored around the Olympics in the summer. So an official year of tourism between the two countries then, uh, and the Olympics hopefully playing a part in attracting uh, more Chinese visitors to France.
Oh, yeah, Team China always does pretty well at the Olympics. They'll be hoping for another good showing as well uh, during the Paris 2024 Games. And, of course, uh, France tourism authorities will be hoping that provides a spark for many international visitors coming here to the French capital in the summer. Now, what is also an aim of the French tourism authorities is to try to return Chinese visitor numbers to what they were before the coronavirus pandemic. Looking to those numbers in 2018 and 2019, the millions of visitors from China trying to get back in 2024 and 2025 to those numbers, not just because of the uh, number of visitors who come, but uh, the, the euros and the dollars that they spend. The Chinese visitors always spend big when they come here to France. So it's also trying to improve those links. But overall, 2024, a very important year for Paris and for Beijing, because on the 27th of January, just a little bit later on this month, Robin will mark 60 years of diplomatic relations between the two sides. Ross, thank you very much. My correspondent, Ross Cullen, there in Paris. And that anniversary is being marked in different ways across China. From Harbin, our correspondent Chen Mengfei reports. Now, of course, this year also marks the beginning of the special China-France Year of Culture and Tourism. As you can see behind me, there is the famous Temple of Heaven in Beijing. And over here, there's the recreation of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, which is, of course, still under reconstruction, but will reopen this year. And earlier, a senior French official was in here in this park to unveil a miniature of these two statues. And I saw her posting on Twitter earlier about uh, her having dinner with Chinese and French officials saying they're going to try to have more flights and have less visa processing time for Chinese citizens to France this year. So it's a great start. For example, this marked the beginning of the year, and then very soon in Beijing, there will be a French opera, Romeo and Juliet, playing. And then later this year, there will be a French play directed by a French director, but in Chinese, by the famous Chinese uh, actor Liu Ye, the uh, Les Misérables, that's going to play in China. So there's going to be a series of art shows, cultural events, taking place both in China and France in more than 30 cities in China. And there's a lot to look forward to for culture lovers. Paralympian Oscar Pistorius has been released from prison on parole nearly 11 years after murdering his girlfriend. The athlete shot dead law graduate and model Reva Steenkamp through a locked bathroom door in his home. He was freed under strict conditions after serving half of his sentence. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, C.S. Duplessis, who's in Johannesburg. Uh, so what's been the reaction in South Africa to the release of Oscar Pistorius? Good afternoon, Robin. Yes, he continues to divide opinion here in South Africa. You have the pro Oscar Pistorius camp and then you have the pro Riva Steenkamp camp and, and they at loggerheads the whole time. He's divided a nation, you know, especially in South Africa with a country that grapples with gender-based violence uh, all the time, uh, elevated violence levels. You know, Oscar Pistorius going to jail was kind of a, a statement by the South African Justice Department and, and how that's all unfolded. Well, he sort of slipped out in the middle of the night. Many people expect that it was early this morning before sunrise and no one got any shots of Oscar getting out of the Jose Mampuru facility in Atridgeville. So at this point in time, there's also a bit of Oscar Pistorius fatigue amongst the South African public. You know, a lot of people are kind of glad that this is now a thing of the past, but he will end up in his uncle's house uh, where he will serve house arrest for the remainder of his sentence. So he's out now on parole. Uh, what happens with his conditions and then what happens once he's served the whole sentence? He's got very strict um, uh, rules that he has to follow. So in terms of he cannot leave the house all the time, he has to let the Justice Department know, um, he cannot drink alcohol, he cannot speak to the media until 2029, uh, he has to undergo therapy as well as anger management classes. So there's a lot that Oscar Pistorius still has to do, but he is under the house of his uncle Arnold in a wealthy suburb in Pretoria, so he will be there for the time being. It is interesting, the speculation that surrounds when his sentence is over in 2029, what he will get up to, will he return? 
return to athletics. Will we ever see Oscar Pistorius near athletics track? Uh, and that remains to be seen. At this point in time, many people think they might even go into coaching. But uh, with Steenkamp's have come out with a, a June Steenkamp has come out with a statement saying that obviously parole was always part of the legal process, but she's very happy with those strict rules that Oscar Pistorius will have to adhere to as he serves the remainder of his sentence until 2029. CS, thank you very much. Uh, that's our correspondent, CS Duplessis, in Johannesburg. More than 300 flood warnings are in place across Britain after Storm Henk. A major incident was declared in Nottinghamshire because of rising water levels along the River Trent. 1,000 homes had to be evacuated as the river hit its highest level in 20 years. Days of heavy rain have seen large areas flooded with major travel disruption. McDonald's says it's seen a meaningful hit to business as customers in the Middle East and elsewhere boycott the restaurant chain over its perceived support of Israel. It follows a row in October when McDonald's Israel announced it had donated thousands of free meals to Israeli troops involved in the conflict. The firm's chief executive has blamed the backlash on misinformation. The headlines again. Crisis diplomacy. The U.S. Secretary of State begins his latest tour of the Middle East, hoping to prevent the conflict spreading. Israeli attacks continue across the Gaza Strip. Palestinian officials say that more refugee camps have been hit. And that is The World Today. Thanks for watching. There's more on CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. We're back with more news at the top of the hour. Coming up next, it's World Insight. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Welcome to Europe's weather forecast. Well, the cold air will continue to impact much of the continent as we get into this weekend, very likely to cause a temperature drop in many places and a large portion of wet weather. See, temperature fluctuation forecast, you will have sliding temperatures from the west all the way to the east over the next two days. For example, the highest image of Ukraine could drop by 10 degrees within two days, so you really need to stay warm. Now, speaking of wet weather, there could be rain chances stretching from Iberian Peninsula all the way to much of Italian Peninsula by Saturday. The sleet and the snowfall could be expected in places like Poland, Germany, all the way to southwestern Russia. Then getting to Sunday, you may really need to cope with some messy wet weather across much of Central Europe and along the west coast of the Balkans, see a chance of localized torrential. For folks up to northern Europe, by Sunday, you could see lowering chances out there. Minus 5 for day highs in Copenhagen, minus 8 for daily highs in Stockholm and Helsinki. According to weather forecast, daily highs out there are ready to bounce back to positive readings as we go into the new week. Well, that's it for now. Stay tuned for more city forecast.